Okay, so we're gonna take, uh, we're leaving Africa behind, we're heading to Australia. And this festival is, uh, you know, one of the major themes is celebrating the weird and the wonderful. And I spent a year living in Australia and I can tell you from experience that uh, some of the wildlife down there definitely falls into that weird uh, and wonderful category. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time with Lillian Stewart. She's a researcher with the Adrift Lab in Tasmania, Australia. So with a background in marine plastics and waste management, she is well suited to spend her next four years on her PhD, uh, working with councils and community groups, tackling waste related issues on remote islands. And then, you know, she really grabbed our attention with her promise to talk today about galls, garbage and bird vomit. So we'll see if she delivers. I'm gonna bring Lillian in. Hey Lillian, how are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Good, good. It's great to have you joining us. It's fantastic to be here. Thank you for putting on such a fantastic event. Uh, honestly, I'm blown away by the caliber of the presentation so far. I, yeah, I'm feeling very inspired and very hopeful about the future. Yeah, absolutely. It's exciting to see so many voices from all around the world, but all united in one thing, spreading awareness and, and stopping what's happening. So very cool. All right, Lillian, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit, and then I bet you we'll have a little bit of Q&A action after. Not a problem. Alrighty, so just checking that you can see my screen. Looks good. Do you want to go down and just hit the high down at the bottom so we see? Um, yeah, let's get rid of that. There we go. Beautiful. Now, are you seeing the correct slide? Oh, uh, yeah. Can you hit the swap? There we go. Yeah. And um, oh, okay. Gosh, I didn't know everyone was like. We'll get it. If you hit the the full screen, I think there's a swap display up at the top uh, that we can use. Yeah, oh. one over. Can you go to the left? Just uh, this one here? No, <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Try the display settings up top. Display and settings. Yeah, and then swap. There we go. Beautiful. Alrighty. Thank you very much, Joe. Sorry about those teething issues there, everyone. So getting into it now. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, depending on where you are coming from today. So my name is Lillian. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Tasmania. Uh, and can I just say how fantastic it is to be here today at the Biodiversity Festival. It's really fantastic that science and community engagement and all these amazing projects are now accessible for people around the world, literally anywhere at any time. So thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'm from Tasmania. I'm gonna be taking you through my recent research that I've done. So I'm gonna be talking to you about gulls, garbage, and how our trash is another gulls dinner. So I would first like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking on Nipaluna country. This is the country of the Palawa people, the original custodians of the land. The indigenous people of this country lived in harmony with the landscape for thousands of years. And I'm gonna strive for a future reconciliation, respect, and acknowledgement of our rich indigenous history where we too continue to care for our country. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and I extend my respect to those from the Indigenous community that are here today. And the flag that you're seeing on the screen now is that of the Indigenous people of Australia. So I'd like to take a moment to mention a Drift Lab. We're a brilliant group of researchers and we're composed of graduate students, established scientists and postdocs, and our work looks at the issue of all things adrift in the ocean, with a particular focus on marine plastics and seabirds. We pride ourselves on our inclusive and diverse team, and we bring together researchers from all across the globe with skill sets from ecotoxicology, marine and avian biology, and things such as statistical analysis as well. Our projects range from monitoring biological factors in sentinel species through to developing and implementing techniques to quantify accumulation of debris in locations all around the world. Our mission is to produce valuable research that can in turn inform policy, it can benefit the wider community, and it will also bring positive change to the ecology of our world's oceans. So, g'day from the other side of the world. Uh, here's a little map to show you where I'm actually coming from. So heading way down under, I'm coming to you from Tasmania, the beautiful island state just south of the Australian continent. My island home is truly stunning, and it's renowned for its diverse, unique, really intricate ecosystems and it is also claimed to have some of the cleanest air on earth. 
We've got everything from postcard perfect beaches to our cool temperate rainforests and alpine regions and everything in between. Tasmania boasts some pretty incredible opportunities for research to be done. I've also got some pretty unique wildlife, such as this Tasmanian devil, which you can see on your screen right now. My research, however, begins in a wetland, specifically this wetland. So what you're looking at here are the Tamar Island wetlands. Um, this site, like many others in Australia, has an uh, Indigenous name. So I also refer to this site as the Kanamaluka wetlands to acknowledge the Indigenous history of the site. Wetland ecosystems are really important because they act like a filter between where rain is collected and the rivers and the oceans where that rain will eventually make its way to. And you can see here there's lots of grassy areas and mud flats and, and uh, vegetation surrounding. This means this area is really biodiverse. There are lots and lots of different species that live here as well. And uh, for me, it's the bird life which is of interest. So what did I come here to look for? This bridge right here is where all the magic happens. Now, you can see signs that birds have been here. There's poop and there's feathers and a few other things on the side of the walkway. So what might be responsible for this? This guy, this elegant fella right here is a Pacific gull. It's the largest of the three gull species here in Australia. And when I say big, they're actually quite hefty. Their wingspan is over a metre and a half wide, about 60 inches or so. My favourite identifying feature about this guy is his red lipstick on the upper and lower parts of his beak. Gulls have gained a pretty bad reputation depending on where you go. At least here in Australia, they are quite famous to appear out of nowhere um, as soon as you open a packet of hot chips and they seem to, matter, seem to multiply rapidly in a matter of seconds. Gulls are actually really important though. They are what we call generalists. And this means they can exploit a large range of food sources and use different foraging strategies depending on the source of their food and, and how the seasons change. This can include things like scavenging for things that have already died. They can opportunistically hunt for things like fish, rodents and even smaller birds. And they've even been documented to collect shellfish, fly up above a rock, drop it, to crack it open to get to the meat inside. So being a generalist, it also means that gulls are really adaptive to changing environments. So if we come back to this bridge in the wetlands, what do you think we're looking for? It's not poo, it's not eggs. You're on the right track if that's the sort of thing that you're thinking. It's actually bird vomit. The bird vomit, or what scientists refer to as a bolus, is a really useful research tool and it can tell us lots of information about what the birds are eating and where they might be going to get that food. Some birds, such as gulls, skewers and birds of prey and owls, they too produce boluses. You might be more familiar with an owl pellet. This might have anything from bone to teeth, sticks, rocks, feathers and squid beaks. And the process of regurgitating these pellets is completely natural. And we estimate that the gulls are doing this about once a day on the bridge in the wetlands where they roost. So what did we do with these little vomit pellets? So for a year and a half, my team and I, we went out and we collected these boluses. And what we did is we stored them each in a Ziploc bag. And in science, we go through a lot of sample bags and containers. But what we did here was we collected sandwich bags from the community, we washed and sterilized them, and we used those to store our samples. And this diverted hundreds of bags from landfill. We took our samples to the lab and we dissected each of them in a tray so we could look at and record everything that the birds had eaten. Each bolus had a detailed data sheet as well, and we could record the items that they'd eaten, as well as the number of items and how much that weighed. We recorded everything from naturally occurring vegetation, rocks, shells and feathers, through to the unnatural things such as plastic, glass and metal. So that our data could also be really useful when compared to other studies from around the world, we also recorded the type of plastic and the colour of it. This was actually a really simple process and pretty much what we do is we just very gently pull it apart, we sort the items and then we count them and record them. 
So what do we find? Now to the fun part of the presentation. Here are two of the boluses that we found, and these are really good examples of the natural items that we'd hope to find. So you've got fish bones, you've got mammal teeth, and you've also got rocks. Now, if you're wondering why the gulls are eating rocks, that's to help them mechanically digest their food. But what we found more commonly was a bit of a different story. We would commonly find boluses that contained items that were really far from what was natural. Because human-derived items like plastic, glass and metal are not digestible, the gulls regurgitate them if they eat them. So what we can see are a few items that stand out. We've got a red plastic road reflector. We've got uh, the elastic string, which um, at least here in Australia, you find in like roast meat, roast lamb sort of thing. We've got a Christmas decoration. And if you're still unsure how this is a Christmas decoration, if you've ever used a plastic or a glass um, bauble, it's a little cap on top with the string that connects it to the tree. We actually found this one in January, just after Christmas. We've got cling or saran wrap. We've got more sheet plastic. And we've also got glass. And this isn't the type of glass that you would find on a beach that's soft and weathered and actually looks quite pretty. This is glass that is still really, really sharp. Taking a closer look at sheet plastic, for example, oftentimes it would be really twisted and compacted, and it's only the size of a large coin. But once we take it apart, once we pull it all out, it's actually a bit of a different situation. And we find pieces that are actually really enormous pieces of sheet plastic. This one here in the, in the photo that you're looking at, we think was a plastic bag before it was eaten. We'd also find some really quirky and often interesting boluses. On the left panel, we've got a single use plastic dental floss pick. You can see here the white pick bit, and then the, in the end of it, you've got the rest of the bolus, and that's collected in the curved shape. We've also got some purple sheet plastic in there as well. On the right, we've got a milk or a juice bottle cap. This one was also interesting because underneath were most of the rest of the bolus. We've also got some shell and some bone on top. This one was also quite fresh. As you can tell, it's sort of covered in mucus. So this one was a little bit more icky to collect. So time for some numbers. We found that a staggering 92.5% of the boluses that we sampled contained at least one item that was not natural. Further breaking that down, 86% of our sample contained at least an item of plastic, 64% at least one item of glass, and 16% at least one item of metal. And when we were looking at metal, that was anything from a rusty nail, a bottle cap, all the way through to X-Acto knife blades. Uh, we found one with an X-Acto knife blade and I was still able to cut paper with that, so I can't imagine what that would have been like for the gull. So what does this mean for our Tasmanian gulls? When we compare this to other studies globally that did a similar sort of study, we found that they found 0.7 to 79% of their sample containing at least one item that was of human origin. Our study, which was 92%, really blows it out of the ocean, really. Considering how I mentioned Tasmania is known for some of the most pristine places on earth, this was actually quite terrifying. And what does it mean when we look at the bigger picture? Based on what we were able to produce with our data, we suggest that at least this population of gulls has largely adapted to forage regularly from sources of unnatural items such as landfills, rubbish bins and trash cans, and even just the litter that is laying around. We found that they also consume these items consistently through the seasons. So this would suggest that there is no evidence of seasonal change and that they're pretty they know it's there, they're going to keep coming back. As we produce rubbish and we send it to landfill constantly, they've recognised this and they know that they can reliably forage at these sites throughout the year and not really worry about going hungry. We also suggest that something else is happening and at the time that my research was published, we hadn't really seen this before. If we take a step back and we look at the bigger picture, when we use an item or we discard the packaging, we presume that it goes to landfill and it stays there and it's contained and it's not a hazard to the environment. However, we suggest that the gulls 
um, they are foraging here and they're actually acting as a transport mechanism, taking those items and depositing them back into the natural environment. So by exploiting this easy food source and regurgitating their pellets on the bridge in the wetlands, these birds are innocently dispersing our waste further than we previously thought. And you might be picking up that this is actually quite bad because once those items are now back into a wetland, they are now in a river. And as we know, rivers don't stay where they are. They flow elsewhere. So what is our role to play? This whole concept is another facet to the plastics problem that is massive. It's really hard to take in the scale of it, and it certainly doesn't spark a lot of joy. We need action from the consumer. We also need action from industry and government collectively if we are to see meaningful change. This said though, everyone that's listening today can spark meaningful change in a few ways. The first is actually quite simple. If we act by refusing to use or seeking alternatives to the common single use items that we use every day, this will drastically reduce the quantity of items ending up in places like landfill. Many of these items that we found in the boluses were single use. They were things like plastic cutlery, plastic bags, hygiene items like the dental floss peak we saw earlier. By acting on the process at this stage, it means we have to do less later on to manage the issue. Now, by no means am I suggesting you go and you purge your house of everything single use, because another important point to consider is to use what we already have. Use it to the last drop, use it till it cannot be used anymore. And when it does come time to dispose of it, be as thoughtful as we can. We live in a society of convenience, a throwaway culture, but what actually does away mean? In the case of the goals, away could be anywhere. The last point I'd like to say, and it's been said many times today, and I'm sure it will be said again throughout this festival, is to keep talking. Keep encouraging the people around you to think about their use of these items and to ask for change around you. If there's a coffee shop, for example, ask if they accept keep cups. If you notice a restaurant using plastic in their takeaway, Ask them for a compostable alternative. Say how you'd love to support business that takes positive action for our environment. And these things do actually work. And if there's anything, whoop, if there's anything you take away from my presentation today, is that you are never too small to make a big difference. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, if you're interested in reading a little bit more in detail about what we did, um, you can find our research uh, published in the Marine Pollution Bulletin. And one of the sayings we have in our lab is that good science happens because of good people. And I'm incredibly lucky to be working alongside some truly incredible people. And of course, incredibly privileged to be speaking alongside more wonderful people today. Thank you very much. All right, Lillian, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, I, I echo that. Uh, you know, good science, good people, and a huge shout out to Jennifer uh, Lavers, who uh, was so nice enough to connect with several members of the Adrift Labs who are covering multiple topics. So really exciting to have um, that representation from Tazzy. Yeah, Jen's absolutely fantastic. Jennifer is my supervisor. She's also the head of Adrift Lab, and she's the reason that I'm speaking here today. She does some absolutely incredible work. She's been doing this sort of work for a very long time, and she inspires a lot of young people to also follow in her footsteps and do the same. Yeah, and you promised bird vomit, and you delivered. So there we go. Good stuff. Um, so I, uh, you know, we, through my organization, Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants, we do um, every year when we kind of have a month devoted to ocean plastics and we have experts from around the world join and we always have someone uh dissect a bird um in uh in rhode island is actually where it's from a seabird and every year uh without fail there's plastic uh in the stomach plastic in the crop so it really is a a global issue and and it sounds like they're dispersing it in ways that that we didn't even know before yeah, it's a really interesting issue in that every time we find out something, it seems that we come across something that we hadn't really thought of before. And that was the case with this study, which I did as part of my honours. Uh, 
we knew kind of that the birds were, were eating these things and depositing them. But once we sort of realised, hey, they're actually popping them into a wetland, that flows straight to the ocean. So now these items, which were once contained in a landfill, sure. are now available to every other organism that's in the ocean, really, and in that wetland system. Um, it's, it's really, it, it just blows my mind, honestly. Gulls are really interesting in that they've managed to, like I said, they're easily adaptable to all kinds of different environments and different food sources. And, and the reason they're eating these items is uh, mainly because they either look like something they would have naturally eaten or they smell like something um, that they would normally eat, especially in the case of, say, like the, the roast lamb string. That probably smells pretty good still. I'm not sure. I'm not a huge fan of roast lamb, but they probably think it's fantastic. Uh, and so these birds have evolved to exploit the easiest source of food, which is our waste. Um, it's just going to be really interesting finding out how that goes going into the future. Yeah. Do you think, um, do you think sometimes, especially with seabirds, it's a case of, you know, you see something and you have to act uh, and snag it before maybe it disappears or, or someone else gets it. Do you think that's a factor? Absolutely. I think as soon as you see something that's beautiful or that captures your attention or you go somewhere that you experience and you just think this is unreal, how can you not think but we have to protect this? And with our gulls, it's a little bit of an uphill battle because gulls, especially here in Australia, everyone kind of hates them. They're everywhere and they're quite annoying. Yeah. But in their natural space and in doing things that they naturally would do where we haven't intervened, they're really important. They clean things up and they, they keep everything in balance, in balance. And like any aspect of biodiversity, once we start to lose species, that's not good. That's yeah. not good at all. That has heaps of negative flow and consequences. And our gulls are just as much part of that as anything else. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, we definitely can't look at, at certain species and say, oh, we don't like them. Um, we have to realize that they do play a role and that take them away and you're affecting another species, which is affecting another species. Uh, and you don't want to fray that tapestry too much. Absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely the biggest take home point for me from doing all of this. Yeah. So <laughs> what would you estimate? How many boluses do you think that you've collected uh, throughout your research so far? Uh, so for this study, we collected uh, between 350 and 400, I believe. Yeah. Um, it was uh, smelly. It was, we came across some really interesting things, uh, but it was, it was really fascinating and it was really rewarding because I've now got a love for this bird that I didn't love as much before, but I think they're really yeah. amazing and they're doing some really unique things. Um, but yes, that, that amount of boluses was an awful lot of plastic, a lot of glass, some weird metal items. Um, and it really did show this, the sheer scale of the issue that we're facing. Yeah, I bet it was pretty rare to come across something that didn't have maybe something man-made uh, in it. Yes, yeah. I mean, look, 92% of our sample had at least one item of man-made rubbish, really. So yeah, almost everyone we dissected, we came across something. And uh, I'm pretty sure if you look around your house and you think of anything that's single use, uh, we probably found it. So you can use your imagination as much as you like there. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there's some next steps to this research. Where is it going to go from here? Well, with this project, I would really love to see some kind of geo-tracking on the birds because there are lots of populations in the area that we research. We can't generalise for all of them, but we can say certainly at least this one population um, has uh, evolved or adapted to feed in this way. What would be really interesting is because there were still things like fish bones and squid beaks in some of them, it would be interesting to see is that the older birds that are foraging at the landfill or still foraging in their more natural areas, um, how they change over time, um, are they still regularly going to the beach but still also regularly going to the landfill? Um, those sorts of things are going to paint the picture a lot clearer for us. So definitely keeping the research going, still collecting them. Anything long term with lots of samples is really good in science. Yeah. So I think we'll just try and keep it going as much as we can. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the, the, the gall species, I mean, they're really interesting species. Uh, and you're right, they're totally overlooked. But, uh, you know, I, I'm curious about uh, some more of their behaviours. Um, you know, do you think that there's populations that are just completely separate and kind of foraging in the wild, or do you think they're all pretty opportunistic um, and get into these I, spots? I definitely reckon there are still populations that are isolated enough 
um, from landfills and from human activity, particularly on, there's a lot of sort of rocky outcrops and islands around Tasmania and there's definitely the birds that are living there and living quite a holistic natural life, eating lots of squid and fish and that sort of thing. Um, I think it will probably be a bit more of a process of once they know that there are other sources available um, over time, they may change their foraging strategies. But that's also another thing to look at is proximity of um, population, say where they roost, compared to um, our urban centres and our, our sites of rubbish and that sort of thing as well. Yeah. And then I bet some of those kind of more remote populations are still probably picking up some plastic that's already kind of drifting in the ocean or maybe even from those boluses when it makes its way through the wetland and, and then right out into that ocean. Absolutely. I mean, we can't dismiss that at all. There's more plastic in our oceans every day. And that pro problem is only compounding as we as we continue to go. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Uh, that would be another thing to look at is the boluses of, of really isolated populations compared to really urban ones as well, just to see the scale of the issue and how much plastic has permeated into the lives of our gulls everywhere. Awesome. And let's end with a little Tassie biodiversity. So I spent a little time there uh, and saw some pretty amazing things. What gets, I mean, outside of gulls, which I know are now a, a favorite of yours, what's what's exciting for you to see out in the wild? Um, I was just out on a hike today and we've got, uh, we've got things called paddy melons. They're basically a little mini kangaroo. They're really cute. They're pretty friendly um, and they seem to just hop out of nowhere. So just picture a really mini, I guess, pocket-sized kangaroo. We've got them. We've also got echidnas. They're always delightful to see. They always just look like they're having the best time. So, yeah, yeah. there's always something good to see in Tassie. All right. Excellent. Well, Lillian, thank you so much for joining us for the Global Biodiversity Festival. Great to have some Australia, Oceania action. Uh, and, yeah, best of luck with uh, your PhD and your research. Awesome. Thank you very much, Joe. Keep up the great work. All right. Thanks, Lillian.